God, will you remind us today of how, how painful it is and that you understand how painful it is sometimes to get back in the ring and to start fighting again. But will you soften our hearts, prepare our minds for the fight because it's worth it. The family members, our fathers, our sons, our mothers, our daughters, our brothers, our sisters, our in-laws, our nieces, our nephews, our cousins, they're worth the fight. So remind your people today how important it is because the end that we're going to hear about today from David and Absalom is not worth it. So help us to fight. We pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said? Amen. Um, in a moment, I want you to stand with me as we read Second Samuel, two verses, uh, verses <clears throat> around about 30, 38 and 39. Second Samuel chapter 13, around about 38 and 39. That's where we want to hang out today. So if you find it in your Bibles, I want you to stand with me. And let's read only two verses today, 38 and 39 of chapter 13. Why don't you stand and let's read the word of the Lord together. <clears throat> Ready? Let's read together. So, so Absalom, Absalom had, had fled, fled and, and gone, gone to Jesser and, and was there, there three, three years. years. The, the heart, heart of King David <clears throat> longed to go out to Absalom. For he was confronted concerning Amnon since he was dead. What I want you to focus on in this verse, the second one, is that David longed to go out to Absalom. Every dad longs for connection with his son. Every son longs for connection with his dad. And no matter what the pain, no matter how excruciating it is, Every mom, every dad, every son, every sibling longs. Somewhere in the bottom of your heart, you, there's a little glimmer that longs for connection. And David, after some pretty brutal stuff that happens that you'll hear about in a moment, um, um, he longs for his son. And his son Absalom longs for connection with him. You may be seated. Um, <clears throat> this week and next week, you're going to hear two stories Today, you're going to hear from a daughter who longs for a relationship with her mom. Next week, you're going to hear about a dad who longs for a relationship with his son. Uh, next week, it, it'll, it'll be pretty rough. Um, 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 so, so you might want to carry extra makeup, ladies. It'll be tough next week. It really will. It really, really will as you hear a story of a dad who longs for a relationship with his son. And a son who has turned his back on him because of the lifestyle that he has chosen to live. Today, however, we're going to talk about a daughter who's a mom that yearns for connection with her mother. Um, we've been in a series, and in the series so far, um, it's the second of four parts. We will conclude on Christmas. Uh, next week and on Christmas, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some how-tos about getting back in the ring. Last week and this week, I simply wanted to establish the importance of, of getting back in the ring and the importance of it's worth the fight, which means we ought to get back in there. I've suggested so far that uh, humility... Ladies and gentlemen, it's better than regret. And so the way we phrased it last time was, was, was that to get back in the ring. We're out here. We don't want the relationship anymore. And, and God is challenging us to be humble and to get back in the ring and fight for our families. The challenge that some of us have is that we have a, a list of reasons why we should not do that why we believe we have a good reason why we should not do it. And I, all I'm trying to suggest in this series so far, last week and this week, is this. Is that it's worth the fight. No matter how hard it is. No matter what they've done to you. Your job is not to parent them. Your job is to honor your parents. God never called you and never commanded you to parent your parents. He asked you to honor them. And so what I'm asking you to do, what I'm asking everybody to do, is to wear the burden of connection. Get back in the ring. Humble yourself and connect with your family. It's easy to write off somebody that's been a neighbor and you've moved away and now you're living in Dallas. 
and you've written them off. That's, that's, that's not too, that's bad, but it's not too bad. You, you, know, no, you don't feel anything, ah, written them off. Easy to do it with a boss who you think was treated you unfairly. But there is something with reference to family that has a connection that you cannot just write it off. You can try, but you yearn for connection. I yearn for it. You yearn for it. Everybody yearns for it. What we've suggested so far is that you're in a warfare and that the spiritual warfare and the, the enemy's job where God has created unity from Ephesians 6 last time we learned, where God has created unity, the enemy is the master of this unity. And so he wants to disrupt every family there is. He wants to disrupt it so that you never are unified. That's the reason he does what he does. Today I'm here to suggest to you that you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but you wrestle against principalities and powers. And so don't be deceived who you're fighting. The person, the enemy has just wrapped himself up in the person called your loved one. And he's trying to make sure there's a wedge between both of you. And what we're trying to suggest through this entire series is that it's worth the fight. Put the boxing gloves back on and get back in the ring. What I'm here today to tell you is that humility on the front end is easier to follow than regret on the back end. Humility on the front end. Stepping in the ring, owning the burden of connection is much easier to follow than regret on the back end. Say that with me twice. Humility on the front end is much easier to follow than regret on the back end. One more time. Humility on the front end is much easier to follow than regret on the back end. Excellent. Okay. Now I'm going to introduce somebody to you that's going to tell a story. She's, been, she's done an amazing job so far. Four serv three services so far. This is the fourth one. It's a tough story. I want you to listen to it. Because here's one courageous woman that got back in the ring and fought for her family. I want you to give, I call her Lady Polk. I want you to give Lady Polk a round of applause as she comes and as she shares with us today. <laughs> it's, different, it's a different kind of a sermon today. So it's going to be part story and part narrative. And so if you want a complete exposition, come back next week. And if you want a complete exegesis, come back the week after that. But today, it's a story. So listen to her story. Go ahead. I want to start off by telling you that um, my mother had me when she was 16 years old. And she was impregnated by a 32-year-old man. How many of you know that's illegal? He didn't stay around very long, but none of them really did. Uh, there was a revolving door of men and relationships and heartbreak and heartache uh, as she matured and grew older. Uh, and through those relationships, now there's three of us. I have a brother and a sister, and I'm the eldest of us three. There was one guy that she preferred more than the rest, and it was my sister's father, who was, in fact, the love of her life. But he was a heroin addict and an alcoholic. Running around with him, uh, somehow it made sense to leave her seven-year-old daughter and two younger siblings at home by themselves for days at a time. I was left to kind of figure it out, how to feed us, how to clean us, how to do all the things that someone else should have been doing. And I was, in essence, robbed of my childhood. But school was my sanctuary, and that's where I went because it was safe and it was good. One day I was called down to the principal's office, and I didn't know why because I was a good girl. So I get there. And there's a social worker in the office, and she's asking a lot of questions, and I'm, I'm concerned, but because I submit to authority, I answer every question she asks, and she's asking, who stays with you when your mom's not home? When's the last time you've eaten? Do you get beatings? And so I answer her questions, and they send me back off to class, and I'm thinking, okay, well, I don't know what that was about, but whatever. And so I go home later that day, and she's sitting in my apartment with my mom. Okay? And my mom's there with my brother and my sister, and she says, 
you guys are going to go with her for a little while. And it'll be okay. It's just going to be temporary. And then you'll be back home. I didn't believe that deep down, but because I'm a good girl, I said, okay, mom. And my brother and my sister, they're crying and they're grabbing at her. And I'm confused because they're always telling us not to go with strangers, but she's telling us now to go with this woman. And I don't know her. And so we go, and I'm scared and, you know, just a child, frightened. And she takes us to an orphanage. Yeah, they exist. Mm -hmm. And I spend the better part of a year there. It was six months before I saw my mother again. Mm. And during the almost year that I was there, she only came to visit twice. And the place in and of itself wasn't so bad. It was lots of kids from different backgrounds and you know, locations. But we were all waiting for a home, for a family to open up their house to us. But in the meantime, the elementary school where I had to go to class was right next door to the orphanage. And every single day, I had to take that walk of shame from the orphanage over to the elementary school doors, single file line, and the normal kids, the ones that had the parents at home that dropped them off every day, I love you, honey, do your best, I love you, were really, really cruel. Made fun, just really abominable behavior, but. So eventually, uh, we found a family, and I'm excited. And they took me and my sister into their home, and I'm thinking, this is going to be good because it's only for a little while, but it's better than where I was, so yeah. it'll be okay. Yeah. It didn't take me long to realize that that was not the case at all. The disparate treatment, because they had kids of their own, uh, was profound in the house itself. And as it turns out, they were in it for the check. And we were essentially indentured servants. Mm -hmm. So when I wasn't fetching something or cleaning something, we were relegated to our room mm -hmm. to stay out of sight because they didn't want us to be around. And they bought their kids all kinds of nice things, nice clothes, and the only time we ever got anything new was the, at the beginning of the school year when they sent the extra stipend for an outfit or two uh, for us foster kids. And their kids went to school two blocks away and got a ride every day. Well, I'm from Michigan and it's pretty, pretty cold. And my school was a mile and a half away. So I know there's an adage out there, but when I tell you I walked to school a mile and a half in the snow when it's 28 degrees outside, with the wind blowing off of the lake. Mm -hmm. It's not a fun thing, not a fun thing. But they didn't really care. My sister, bless her heart, could not find a constructive way to channel her anger. So she was always in trouble. And so much so, so they, they just got tired and they couldn't handle her. Once the beatings became ineffective, and sometimes that happens, you beat so much that you're just defiant. Mm. They called the social workers again and said, we can't take this, come get them. And they split us up. And I thought to myself, oh God, what's next? Mm. Where will I end up? I ended up in the house with a pedophile. <laughs> His wife worked, but he did not. And he was always home. Mm. I wasn't safe, not even in my room. Mm. I found ways to cope as best I could. I'm 11 by then, so I'd go to the library uh, every day and stay until it closed. Or fortunately, my brother had found a nice, kind family that lived four blocks away from us. So. On the weekends, after I did my chores, I ran over to his house because I knew I was safe over there. 
And that worked for a while. Till I woke up one day, I was sound asleep. He's standing over my bed and I have to fight him off. But as luck would have it, or God, um, somebody in his family passed away and they had to go out of town for a couple of days to attend the funeral. And I convinced them at that point to allow me to go and stay with my brother until they returned. When that happened, it was good until the last day, and I panicked. I was like, oh, I can't go back there. What am I going to do? So I went to my brother's mom. I said, I can't tell you why, but I can't go back there. She said, please don't make me go back. She asked her questions, and she couldn't get it out of me, but I think she knew. So she made some calls, and I was able to stay with them from that point forward. But I'm thinking to myself, where's my mother? Why am I dealing with this stuff? Who's, who's, she's supposed to be taking care of this, taking care of me. I'm angry. I'm bitter with her now. In fact, I hate her now because she's done nothing but lie, disappoint, and let me down. But I grow up, and I'm in a safe environment, and I'm semi-okay. <laughs> and I find somebody that can put up with me enough to want to marry me, so I'm getting married, and I think I should invite my mom because what kind of woman would I be if I didn't? So I buy her a plane ticket, and I'm like, okay, it's going to be all right. I get a phone call two hours before the flight's supposed to take off, telling me she's not coming to my wedding. I said, what do you mean? She says, well, I'm not going to be able to make it. I said, why? She had gotten paid from her job the day before, which should have made it okay. But somehow she thought it was a good idea to go to the casino. And she gambled up all of her money and was too embarrassed to make the flight. Well, I had a few choice words, and God bless me. I said them all, and I apologize. <laughs> but I was so done. I, I just I couldn't take it anymore. That was the last time I was going to allow her to hurt me, and I just let it go. And I knew she was okay because every once in a while I'd hear that she was out there and I guess doing all right, I don't know. Uh, every now and then she'd call, but it'd be a 50-50 chance whether or not I answered the phone. She called one day and I guess I was in a good mood because she got lucky, I answered. And she said to me, she said, can you help me? And I said, with what? I'm living in a homeless shelter, and I'm hungry. Can you send me some money so I can eat? What do you say to that? After all of the hurt, the pain, the disappointment, the lies, I could have hung up on her, but I didn't. I said, Mama, you don't have to live like that. You can come stay with us. And she did. She stayed with us. And I had to forgive her for everything, for every hurt, every bruise, every inappropriate touch. I had to forgive her. And our relationship is not perfect. It's a work in progress, but it is what it is. And if I claim to walk with Christ, this is what I have to do.
Father, will you, will you help us? Those who have been hurt just like that or even more that are sitting in the audience today and cannot come to forgive, cannot come to put the past aside and get back in the ring. Will you just gently, gently remind us of how much you love us and how much you want the best for us. Shower us with your grace so that we can be gracious to others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One more time, let's hear it for Lady Brooke. <clears throat> share that four times in a day it's pretty tough um, to hear it four times it's pretty t it's pretty difficult not to not to get emotional four times as I was wondering if we should just you know kind of put it on videotape so she doesn't have to go through that every single time um, but I know some of you can resonate with what she's been through and I'm just going to ask you to to bear with us as we simply remind everybody else why it's worth the fight and then to next week to give you some tools to really get back in the ring and how to, how to make sure um, you're creating boundaries while you, while you take the burden of connection on. All right, um, I wanna show you what the, what the end looks like when you don't make the connection. That's what I wanna show you. Um, it's, it's not a pretty story, um, very graphic one. When you have some time, I'd love for you to read Second uh, Samuel 13 through 18, an amazing chapters, some amazing chapters in the book. I, I, I'm telling you, there's some stuff in here that I can't even talk about. And most of you all know me now, I talk about anything. But there's some stuff in here that's X-rated. I can't talk about it. You never thought that was in the Bible, huh? Go read it. You'll see. Uh, Second Samuel 13 through 18. I promise you, you'll be, your, your mouth will be open the foolishness that goes on in these chapters. But let me tell you what it looks like, what the end looks like. Let me tell you the story, and then we'll wrap it up in the time that we have left. There are four characters in the story. I need you to know what their names mean because none of them will live up to their names. All right, the first one, Absalom. Salam, peace. Ab, Abba, father. The name means father is peace. He's not going to live up to it. Second character, Amnon. Oldest son of David. He, he, he is the successor. He has the right to the throne. Firstborn. His name means faithful. It means stable. He was none of those. Next character, Tamar. The word means palm tree or fruitfulness. Never became that either. Last one, Joab. Uh, last Ab for Abba, Job, part of the, the Yahweh. It means Yahweh is Father. Four names, four characters. None of them are going to live up to what their names suggest they should. Let me give you the backdrop. It's about 1010 B.C. Amazing patch. About 1010 B.C. This is, this is, bef this is after um, David and Goliath. This is after Bathsheba. And David. This is after all of that. He has his eldest son. His name is Amnon. He shows up. For some reason, Amnon desires and craves his half-sister, Tamar. He wants to sleep with her. And he craves her. Every fiber of his body craves this girl. His servant says, I, I, I know what you should do. You should pretend fake like you're ill Ask David to send her over so she can feed you when she's there. Then you can sleep with her. Thought it was a good idea, so he did it. She came over, wanted to take care of him as her brother. And, and in the middle of that, he, he, he tries to rape her. And she stops and she says, please don't do such a thing. You can't do this because it will bring disgrace upon me. It will bring disgrace and shame upon you. You don't want to do this. She says, let me give you an, another way out. Why don't you ask dad if you can marry me? At least that way it doesn't look as bad. Doesn't listen to her at all. And he goes ahead and rapes her. And his dad, David, does nothing. What's supposed to happen is he's supposed to be put to death 
for doing that. His dad, David, does nothing. Oh, but uh, Tamar goes to Tamar goes to her brother, her full brother, Absalom. On the way out, uh, Amnon kind of pushes her out, locks the doors, and the text reads that Amnon said, he said this, he said, he said, my hatred for Tamar is greater than the passion I had a couple minutes ago before I raped, before I raped her. She goes off. She's now with Absalom. Absalom sees that his dad does nothing. Absalom now rages and he is angry and he wants to get even, but he waits two years, two full years to come up with the perfect plan. The perfect plan was a family reunion. It was Thanksgiving dinner. He says, I'm going to get back. Dad, you don't want to do nothing? He says, okay, I got a plan. He says, Dad, I need you to come over. Every, all the sons, all the daughters, I need the whole family to come over so we can have this family room. David says, no, I can't come, but all the sons can go. All the sons went, and Absalom executed his plan. He killed Amnon and got revenge. Word got to David that the whole family was killed. And so David thought, okay, hold on. He might be trying to take over the palace. And so then David, word came to him and said, no, just Amnon. And David did nothing. Absalom, in light of that, left the city in fear of his life, left the city with some men. And that's where the verses that you read show up. Absalom fled the city, but the text says, the king, the heart of the king, longed for his son. Every dad longs for connection with his son. Every son longs for connection with his dad. David's out of the ring. But he longs deep down inside, even though there's murder, even though there's rape, even though it's bad, he longs for connection with his son. Even though the past looks bleak and ugly, he longs for connection with his son. Every man has it. Every woman has it. Every son has it. Every daughter has it. Long for connection. Chapter 14 shows up. Um, Joab, the chief of uh, David's military, he shows up and he says, I, I see that my king longs for a relationship with his son. So I'm going to make that connection. So he brings a lady from another city. She, brings, she comes in and she says, uh, uh, he says, Joab says to her, I want you to go and get the king emotional so he can see himself, so he can know that he needs to connect with his son. So she comes up with a story, lies. And by the way, lying is punishable by death, right? So she comes up with a story and she says, hey, hey King David, I'm, I'm so broken. One of my sons killed another son and it just looks bad and, and I don't know what to do. And David says, well, here's what you do. You need to, you need to get this son and, and you, need to put him, you need to punish him for doing that. And, and, David, and, and in the middle of responding to her, David says, hold on. This seems very familiar. David says, did Joab put you up to this? And so now everybody's fearful of their lives. Job is like, okay, hold on, hold on, King. Well, really, what I was trying to do, well, really, King, what I was trying to say, and now everybody's getting out. David says, calm down. Go find my son. Bring my son back to me. I want to hang out with my son. Bring, bring him back. And here we go. Close to the ring. Not in the ring. Close to the ring. Watch it. Watch what the text says. I love this passage. Go all the way down to 1424. 1424, and let's read that together. Chapter 14, verse 24. Let's put it on the screen and let everybody read it together. Read it with me, church. However, However the, king the king said, said let, let him, him turn to his own house and let him not see my face. So Absalom turned to his own house and did not see the king's face. Are you face. kidding me? Are you kidding me, David? You want him to come close, but you don't want to fight all the way. You want to be humble, but you kind of want to be humble so the church knows, but you don't want to be humble in your heart and really humble yourself and go talk to your son. David says, I want him close, but I don't want to see him still. I'm not that humble. We do that all the time. Here's what we say. We say, I, 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 no, I'm not going to see her. I'll give her some money, but I ain't going to see her. I'm not going to see him. I, I, I don't want to see him. I don't want to have nothing to do with them. I'll give him some money. That's what they need. Give him a little money. Give him a, give him a lunch meal. Give him something. But I'm not going to get that close. Some of you say, um, I, will, I will go over to the house, but I'll only spend an hour, and I'm leaving. 
Some of you say, I'm not, no, I will never be in the same house again with that person. We can, they can come over here, but I will never step foot in their house. And you come up with ways, here we go, to put one foot in the ring and one foot out, but you're not going fully in. It's exactly what David did. One foot in, one foot out, not going to do it. So Absalom says, uh, Joab, you called me here to see my dad. I long to see my dad. I want to connect with my dad. So he says, you don't want to see me? So he asks him one time, hey, come see me so I can see my dad. He doesn't respond. Joab, Absalom sent to Joab again. Come see me. He doesn't respond. So, so Absalom says, okay. Oh, you're going to see me. Oh, yeah, you're going to see. Oh, you, you don't think so? Okay. So his, his property is right beside Joab's property. So guess what he does? Set it on fire. True story. It's in the Bible, y'all. Intrigue. Action. Better than scandal. Check it out. Uh-huh. Y'all watch scandal, huh? Anyways, come on. Come on with me. Come on with me. Go read. It's much better than scandal, y'all. Anyways, so, so he sets it on fire to get his attention. Guess who comes running? Joab. Hey, okay, what you want? What you want? What you want? You don't set my stuff on fire, man. Just ask me. What you want? I've asked you twice. You haven't responded. That's why I set it on fire. So he says, okay, go to my dad and tell my dad I want to see him. I want to see him now. I want to see my dad. I want to connect with my dad. A little bit of connection, but he yearns for it. So David says, all right, come on. I'm going to show you the meeting. Chapter 14, verse 33. Verse 32 shows that he's young, longing for the connection. Look at verse 33. This is the moment they've all been waiting for. David longed for it. Absalom longs for it. The whole family longs for it. Verse 33 is the moment, the totality of getting in the ring and fighting for your family. Here's what it looks like. Let's read it together. Verse 33 of chapter 14. Chapter 14, 33. Here we go. Sometime. Here we go. All right. So Joab, so when Joab came to the king and told him, he called for, thus he came to the king and. That's it, y'all. That's the totality of their meeting. No, none of them got in the ring. They kind of they held on to the ropes and said, hey, all right, we did our thing. Let's do it. That's all I can do. I want to come this close, but I'm not going any further. So some of us are. Say, I'm not getting in there. I don't care. It's too painful. It's too hard. I'm not getting in there. This is what the end looks like. No, I want you to see how that fuels Absalom's anger. That this is what you call me all the way from Gesher to come here, to come see me and then kiss me and say bye. You're not going to see me no, again, never again. Absalom gets back. So, so you know what he does in light of that? He goes to the city gates. And at the city gates, he said, we all right? Okay. At the city gates, he said, um, I am going to get a following toward me and against David. And he does it after a few times, and he gets a following. After the following, he has to leave because he now has an army, and he can fight David. So he leaves and prepares to attack Jerusalem. David didn't want a civil war, so David leaves, and he's out of there because he doesn't want a civil war. So, so, so Absalom comes in, and listen, this is the X-rated part. I'm not going to say it. You have to read it. And here's what he does. He takes the king, the kingship, he takes the palace, he takes all his wives. He goes up to the top of the palace so that everybody can see. And he does some utter foolishness that is truly worse than scandal. Go read it for yourself. I'm not talking about it. Go read it. He, he embarrassed him nationally and internationally, all because of anger. All because there was a connection that was desired that was never had. This is what the end looks like when you decide, I'm not going to connect with my family. I don't care what they do. I don't care what they say. I don't care what Jesus says. I'm not going to do it. When you do that, let me, let, me, let me just explain two things that's happened immediately. You now model for your kids that it's okay to write somebody off. More importantly than that, we have many people today that have relational drama, whether spousal or other family relationships, that are really driven by things that were not dealt with with your dad and with your mom. So there are longings that you have from your parents that you now demand of your spouse. And because they don't do it, you're mad at them and you get so irate at them when really all you're looking for 
is connection with mom and dad. Man, we struggle with this big time. A lot of us want approval from our dads, never got it. So we look to work to get it. We look to other people to give it to us. And we don't realize that if you don't get that from God, nobody, nobody, no one individual can fill your cup enough if you don't get that from God. If you don't deal with the past, but what they couldn't get by is they couldn't get past the past. They could not get past the past. And because they could, they didn't come in the ring. And that's what some of us are struggling with today. We can't get past the past. And because we can't, we don't get in the ring. Let me show you how this ends. Listen, here's how the story ends. So, so in his anger, Absalom says, I'm going to fight David in open field. No, he thought because he was young, cute, and handsome, he can just go out there and beat David. But he didn't know that David was a mighty warrior. And David is the master of the open field. So him and his men come out. In anger, he made a bad decision. He should have waited till David come to him. But no, he wanted to get it done so quickly. And whenever you're angry, you make poor decisions. So he went after him. The text is beautiful. It's really rich. So he goes after him. He goes after me. Oh, listen, 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 listen. And David beats him like, like, like nothing, just, just wipes them all out. Now, you need to know something about Absalom. Absalom was a handsome dude, and he had his hair. He, his, the, his pride was his hair. Weighs about five pounds. So he'd always weigh his hair and say, look at my hair. It's so cool. Ooh. All right. It weighs five pounds. Be careful what you make your idol because that's not what's going to get him killed, his idol. So in the text, the text continues, and the text says, after everybody was defeated, all the men were defeated, Absalom's trying to run away. He's on his mule. His mule goes under a tree. His hair gets caught. Listen to this. It's hilarious. His hair gets caught in a tree. The mule goes from under him, and he's left hanging by the same thing that he prided himself with, his hair. The men come up. The soldier, David soldiers come up to kill him, and then they said, oh, no, remember, you can't kill him. Then Joab comes, the, the, the one he gave the direct order to. And he drives a spare and kills him. The men come back to the city. Y'all, it really is in the Bible. The Bible is rich, man. Don't, don't, don't get stuck on scandal. Read the Bible. Um, um, so he, the men come back to the city. They're, they're mourning. Why? Because David lost his son. David's mourning. Last verse, 1833 says, he's, he's weeping Absalom, Absalom. Weeping. How did he get there? Listen, because they didn't connect with each other. Listen. 20,000 men died because a father and a son couldn't agree. 20,000. Let me ask you some. Who's going to be affected by you staying out of the ring? Which generation is going to be hurt or will continue your tradition because you will not step in the ring? In the same way that 20,000 men died because David missed his connection. I promise you, your kids will have a lesser life because you decided it was okay not to. Last verse, and I'll close with this. 1414, if you have your Bibles, put an asterisk beside this verse, the part B of it. It's a profound thought from a woman who, who we really don't even know her name. It just says... A woman, the woman of Tekoa. Watch this, 1414, read part B. It's an amazing little nugget in the midst of this verse. Watch it. Here we go. Read it with me, the yellow part. Yet God does not take away life, but plans will not be cast out. Read it again one more time. Don't miss this, please. Yet God does not take away life, but plans ways so that the banished one will not be cast out from him. No, that's good news. Here's what God does for you and me. He finds ways to make sure that we who are supposed to be banished are included. He finds ways to fight for you. He finds ways to make sure you are not the outcast, but that you feel his love and he fights for you. So here's what he's asking you to do. The very same thing he did for you. What he's asking you to do is to, is to find ways to love your sibling. Find ways to connect with your Father, find ways to connect with your daughter. Find ways to connect with your mother-in-law. Find ways to connect with your cousin. Find ways to connect. We're going to talk about some of those ways next week. 
All I want to establish today is this. Do not let the past prevent you from owning connection and moving toward that connection. Because for David and for Absalom, they did not. And a generation was lost because of it. And I'm begging you. The reason you want to pursue those relationships, here's why. Because it reflects the character of your father and you want to be just like Christ. Now let me explain something to you. Please don't get, don't get me wrong. If you don't know Jesus, it makes sense to me that you don't want to get in the ring. Because it's not a natural act, it's a supernatural act. But if you know Jesus and you have agreed that it's not your will but his will be done. And Jesus is taking over your life. The reason you can do it is because it's not your life to live. It's his life to live through you. And if you're surrendered to Christ, then putting the gloves on and fighting for your family reflects his character. I'm not asking you to rush in. I'm asking you to take the first step. Own the burden of connection. You humble yourself. You get past the past. And just like Lady Polk did, the one who did not make room for her, she now has to make room for her and allow her to live in her house. Aren't you glad that God did that for you? So now can you extend the same grace that was given to you to the one that you find difficult to love? Father, I, I, I really do know this one's not easy. I know it's not. Will you gently remind us of your love toward us, your grace, your mercy, you finding ways to reach out to us and bring us to yourself. And, and when, we have been, when we have been immersed in your grace, will you help us now to find grace to those who we care for as well. And even though it's a small connection that we desire, even though the past looms large, the pain is excruciating, will you help us to... To, to take the first couple steps of connection, whether that means making a phone call, writing a letter, whether that means setting an appointment, whether that means going to dinner, whether that means going to coffee, whatever it means, whatever it looks like, will you help us to take the first couple steps in that direction as we try to reach out and truly connect with our family because it's worth the fight, which is why we ought to get back in the ring, put the gloves on and fight for our families. Help us to do that, God, we pray. In Jesus' name. All God's people said, come on.